So this last unit is on counting methods um, and also something called the binomial theorem, which is going to use some of the counting methods that we're going to learn. Counting methods sort of sound exactly as they are. They're a systematic way of counting things, <laughs> okay? Um, and typically what we do is we count the number of ways we can do something, okay? So for example, if I had to make a group of three students out of all of the students in this class, how many ways could I do that? Okay, that would be one example. Another example is, um, you know, how many different license plates are possible if we have certain parameters around the license plates. I think in Calgary it's like three letters followed by either three or four numbers, right? So with those parameters, how many different life license plates are possible? If we exceed the number of cars as the number of possibilities, we have to start, you know, making new parameters. So I think actually, um, I feel like when I moved here 15 years ago, it was only three numbers and now it's four. So maybe there's been more license plates and we need to add an extra digit in there. So that's sort of the thing that we're gonna be looking at. Um, the types of counting that we can do or the, the types of arrangements or groupings that we can do are typically divided into two groups um, or two categories, I should say, either a permutation or a combination. Okay, so how many ways can we permute something or combine something? Um, and there's a big difference between the two. So just to sort of illustrate the difference, um, if you, do you guys ever go to like a potluck and someone asks you to bring fruit? Something like that? Yeah, okay, so there's like two types of people in the world. The people like me and the people that I don't understand. But if you were asked to bring fruit for a potluck or whatever, you could either do this, where you have a platter, and if you're like me, you'd pick like six different colors fruits, and they'd go in the order of the rainbow because that looks really pretty. So you'd have like strawberries, and then, I don't know, oranges, and then pineapple, red, orange, yellow, green, uh, kiwi maybe, green, blue, purple, blueberries. blueberries and like grapes maybe. Okay, so that's what I would do. And I mean, I suppose it would be okay if you did this in a slightly different order. So if you wanted to group like your berries together, I can get behind that. I can understand. Okay, and then there's the people who quite frankly, I don't understand these people, <laughs> but they take a bowl and they make a fruit salad and they just chuck everything in there and they mix it all up, right? So they just throw in their strawberries and their oranges and their pineapple and the kiwi and the blueberries and the grapes. And then they mix it all up. Okay. The first one is a permutation, the second one is a combination, okay? Permutation is a situation in, when, in which the order of the objects in the arrangement makes a difference, okay? Combination is a grouping of items or a grouping of objects in which order doesn't matter. So if you're putting everything into the same bowl and you mix it up, it doesn't matter if you put the kiwi in first and then the orange and then the pineapple, it doesn't matter. You're gonna mix it up anyway and so here, the order of the items doesn't matter. Order. Okay. Uh, here, order matters. And so typically, we would refer to a permutation as like an arrangement. You're arranging a certain number of objects. 
And a combination is like a grouping. You're grouping things together. Doesn't matter who gets picked first, still forms the same group. Okay, and we're gonna be looking at how many different ways can we do groupings or arrangements of various objects. Okay, now this is a very arbitrary case. Most people don't care about this kind of thing. I'm unique, but um, for fruit, I mean. But uh, there are some situations where order very much does matter. And in fact, um, a combination locker is actually not a combination locker, it's a permutation locker. Because you have three numbers and you have to get them in the right order. You can't switch up the order of the numbers in your combination locker and then the lock opens. It doesn't work that way, okay? So it's actually kind of a bad word for that kind of thing, but um, that would be an example of a permutation, a pin code, a password, a phone number, a license plate, that sorts of thing. Um, combinations, the, anything that's going into the same pot, so it's actually really easy to think about with food because if you put like salad or smoothies or soups or whatever, it's going into the same pot. Um, but also things like if you're making a group of people, um, sometimes, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Um, it depends on whether the group has positions. So if I say I want a committee of three people, then order doesn't matter. If I say I want a committee with a president, a vice president, and a secretary, then order matters because it's, it would be a different group if two, one person was a president and then another person swapped in and went, was the president, right? So um, groupings of people are often combinations. Um, teams, again, you'd have to look at whether or not there's positions on those teams or not, um, but certain teams would be combinations, things like that, okay? Um, so this is really what we're going to be looking at, and we're going to be looking at how do we calculate the number of permutations or the number of combinations that we can make, uh, what if there are cases, what if, if there are restrictions, how do we deal with that, okay? So uh, a lot of people call, including myself, will call this, this unit perms and comms for short, so you may have heard that before, and that's where these, those, uh, that phrase comes from, okay? So counting methods. Counting methods are a systematic way of counting number of possible arrangements or groupings. And there are two types, permutations and combinations. Okay, so permutations would be an arrangement in which order matters. Each object is going to a specific place in the order. order of the objects matters. And a combination is a grouping in which the order does not matter. Okay? So, Simple example, a cell phone kiosk sells three different models of phones and offers four different cases. Draw a tree diagram that represents the different options if a customer buys a phone in a case and then lists all the possibilities. So the idea with the tree diagram is that you have sort of a stage of branches for every decision that you're making. So the first decision that you need to make is what phone are you gonna buy, okay? So if we call the phones A, B, and C, and the cases 1, 2, 3, and 4, then for the first decision, you have to choose a phone. So you could choose A, B, or C. And then for the second decision, you have to, you have to choose a case. So if you choose phone A, 
there are four possible cases that you could buy. Same with B and same with C. Okay, and so at the end of the day, there are 12 possible um, options or possibilities that you could buy. You could buy, if you go to the end of the branches, phone A case one, phone A case two, phone A case three, phone A case four, and then same for all the other ones, right? This one would be B1, B2, B3, B4, and C1, C2, C3, C4. Okay, so there's 12 possibilities. Ah, possibilities. I can't spell today. Okay, now, as you might imagine, using a tree diagram is really inefficient particularly when you up the number of choices. And I don't know about you, but if I have to get a new cell phone, I sort of get overwhelmed by the number of choices of models and gigabytes and I don't know what. And then you have to pick the phone plan. And I know, it's overwhelming. So anyway, it's still overwhelming, even if there's a simpler way of calculating it math mathematically. Um, another way that we can look at this is that if you have three options for the first decision, and four options for the second decision, in total you're gonna have three times four possibilities. So the way that I like to uh, work out these, this is a permutation situation, is have a space for each decision that you're going to make. So we're gonna make two decisions here. And we have to pick a phone, and then we have to pick a case. And in here we're gonna put the number of options for each decision. So we have three options for the phone, four options for the case, and that's 12 possibilities altogether. Okay? So the fundamental counting principle is essentially how we worked out this last question. Okay, the fundamental counting principle basically says if you have to perform a certain number of tasks and you have a certain number of options as to how you can perform each task, the total number of possibilities is going to be the product of all of those options. Okay, so let's say if there are X ways to perform the first task. Y ways to perform the second task. Z ways to perform the third task, etc. Okay, suppose there are X ways to perform the first thing y ways to perform the second, z ways to perform the third. The total possibilities would be x times y times z. And then if there are more tasks, um, you'd multiply the number of options for each of those tasks as well. So for example, if a restaurant meal consists of one of two salad options, one of three entrees, and one of four desserts, how many possible meals could be made? Well, we have to pick a salad, an entree, and a dessert. Okay, and it looks like there are two salad options. There are three entree options and four dessert options. So that's all together 24 meals. Okay. 
All right, classic question, arrangements of letters or arrangements of numbers, okay? How many ways can you arrange the letters in the word math? Okay, how many ways can you arrange those letters? Notice you don't have to make a word, you just have to arrange them. If you have to make a word, then we can't use these methods to figure out how many words can you make, right? There are lots of apps for that, though, if you want to play those kinds of games. Um, okay, so if there's no restrictions, how many items do we have to arrange? Four, and we're arranging all of them, okay? So we are going to have to have spaces for four letters to go, okay? Now, so if you almost want to imagine that there are little Scrabble blocks in a bag. How many possibilities do we have if we're placing the first letter? Four, okay? And then what about the second letter? Three, because we've taken one out the bag, exactly. So times three, times two, times one, okay? So there's four letters, and now there's three left, and then this is just like et cetera, right? It keeps going. So that's uh, 24 possible arrangements, okay? Now, what if each arrangement has to begin with a vowel? So we're still arranging all four of them, but a vowel has to come first, okay? How many options would we have for the first letter? One, it has to be the A. So there's only one possibility to go there. And then what about the second letter? Three, right. Three, two, one, right? So here, three left. So this is six, okay? Now I, the, the crossover between math 30-1 and 30-2 in this section, perms and comms, is almost identical. I marked this question for 30-2, the perm and comm question, on the diploma exam. And if you did all the spaces, but you forgot to put the multiplication symbols, you got half a mark off. And I'm guilty of doing that all the time because I'm working quickly and I know it's gonna be multiplied, so I just put the numbers in and then I multiply. Yes? You don't have to put spaces down, but between, if you're showing your work, which is like a determined question, you'd have to show this calculation and you have to put the multiplication signs in. Exactly, yes. Or you don't know if you're adding or what. I mean, you don't get zero, but if it's out of two, you get one and a half kind of thing, right? Um, and I, I'm guilty of that all the time because, you, you know, you're doing so many questions like this, you know they're going to get multiplied. Yeah. You guys are good? Okay. All right. So, a lot, I, I, <laughs> I have to apologize, a lot of these perms and comms questions are quite gendered. Uh, yeah, we should really take a look at that, but anyway. How many different ways can a teacher seat four girls and three boys in a row of seven if a boy has to be seated at the end of each row? Oh yeah. <laughs> Maybe, well, maybe not. Maybe they're just trying to separate the boys from each other because t typically when you have young children, the girls behave better than the boys because they're more mature. I don't know. Anyway, okay. So how many objects, we're going to ob objectify people here. How many objects do we need to arrange? Seven. So we're going to have seven spaces. Okay. Now, this is a question, just like actually that math question, the first part A didn't have any restrictions. You could put any letter in any spot. In the second question, we had the restriction that the arrangement had to start with a vowel. This question also has a restriction, a couple of restrictions actually. So typically you wanna deal with those first, right? So we know that in this arrangement, the ends have to be boys. Okay, so let's suppose we're putting the first person here. How many options do we have for that first person? Three. Three. Okay, and then what about here? Two. Two. Okay, and then going back here, now we can seat whoever we want. And you can do it from left to right or right to left. 
I usually go left to right because that's the way we read. But I every so now and then start have people placing these next, and that's fine. But here, OK, we're now placing anyone. But how many people are left? Five left. OK, so this would be times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And that is, I think, 720, I think. Because this is 20 times 6 is 120, times 6 is 720. Yeah. But you could do that on a calculator. OK? All right. Numerical arrangements. How many three-digit numbers can you make using the digits 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 if repetition of digits is not allowed? So if you can't repeat the digits, you're making a three-digit number. That means we need to place three digits. Okay, how many options do we have for the first digit? Five, and then? Four, and then? And that's 20 times 60. Okay. Okay. Now, how would this change if you could repeat the digits? Because in fact, that's actually true. When we're forming a number, you can repeat digits, right? The number 222 is an example of a three-digit number where you repeat the, the same digit three times. Yeah. Uh, well, how many options would you have for the first digit? Five. Then the second one, five again, because you can reuse them. And the third one is five, which is 125. Okay, couple things about digits that are important to know. And I know you guys already know this, but sometimes we forget. So firstly, how many digits are there? How many digits are there? 10, yes. So a lot of people think 9 because it's 1 to 9, but it's 10. It's 0 to 9. So there's 10 digits all together, okay? If you were making a three-digit number, could the first digit be anything? If you're making a three-digit number, what could the first digit not be? Zero, yes. So you have to read the question really carefully. In this case, zero is not an option in the first place, so it doesn't matter. But if, it, if the question asks how many PIN codes could you make, PIN codes you can start with zero. If it says how many four-digit numbers could you make, if you have the first number in a four-digit number is zero, it's actually a three-digit number. Okay, so you have to think very carefully. And we'll see some examples of that a little bit later on. Okay. Factorial notation. So what you may have noticed, and I'm going to point it out to you right now, is that in a lot of these questions, we start with a number, and this is even just part of it, and we multiply from that number down to 1. Okay? And actually, that's why I knew that this was 720 so easily, is because I'm used to doing those types of calculations. But a factorial notation um, uses an exclamation part, uh, mark. And essentially, it's the product of numbers from n all the way down to 1. So n factorial is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times all the way down to 3 times 2 times 1. Okay? And for example, uh, 7 factorial is 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay, and these factorials tend to come up a lot when we're doing these types of questions. And there is a button on your calculators. Uh, so I'll show you where that is for factorials. It's in different places on each calculator. And on the Casio, it's a lot easier to use because the menu just stays up there. With the TI, you have to go to the menu every single time. Okay, so I'm going to show you quickly uh, where it is on the, I just want to make this bigger because it's hard to see. Okay, on the Casio, 
If you go to menu and you want to go to run, and then if you click options and shoot. Okay, hold on. Okay, yes, okay. So click options. You have to, when it gives you the options, so this is what will show up right away when you click options, which is this button here. You have to select more options, which is this arrow here. So press F6. And then you want to select probability, okay? Um, there it is. And then you have, this is your factorial button, X factorial. These NPR and NCR, we're going to see what those mean over the next couple of days. But it's a formula for, this is NPR for permutations and for combinations. We'll look at the permutation one today. But they're all sort of in the same place. So if you wanted to know 7 factorial, you would hit 7. Oh, why is it doing that? My smart board's acting up. No, I'm going to have to do it for my computer. Okay, so I'll hit 7 and then hit F1 and enter and it gives you the value. Okay, um, on the TIs, so you have to hit number seven first or whatever factorial you want to take. And then you go to the math button, it's right along the left side. And go over to the right to the probability menu. And then select number four. That exclamation mark is um, factorial. Okay, now the nice thing with the Casio is that if you have this menu up, you can just use it every single time. You don't have to keep going to option and probability. With the TI, every time you want to do one of those three things, the factorial or the permutation formula or the combination, you have to go to that um, math button and go over to probability every single time. Okay, but it's not a huge deal. Okay. So, for example, an online shopping website requires users to set up a password consisting of six letters. Hackers try to access the site by guessing the password, but it is not enough to know the letters. They must enter them in the correct order. How many six-letter passwords can be formed if the letters cannot be repeated? Okay. So letters can't be repeated. We're making a six-letter password. So we are going to make six spaces because we have to choose six different letters. Okay. How many options do we have for the first letter? 26, yes. And then the second one? 25, 24, 23, 22, 21. Okay, so I don't even know what this is. It's a very large number. Some, one, somebody can calculate this if you want, but it's going to be a very large number of passwords, okay? Um, it would take the hackers a long time to break in, and in fact, it's not practical to use just the human brain to hack a system like this. You'd have to use a computer program to do it, so right? It uses scientific notation. It uses scientific notation. Yeah, it's large. Okay, so I don't even care what it is. Now, this kind of looks like a factorial, but it cuts off at 21. Doesn't go all the way down to 1. Okay? And um, this is where that NPR formula comes in, which is what you saw on the screen. So there's a formula that we can use for permutations. And I'm going to use this example to sort of show why it works. And the formula is this. NPR is equal to n factorial over n minus r factorial, okay? And essentially, this is the formula that gives us the number of ways that we can permute n objects if we are permuting r of them, okay? So this is the number of ways we can permute or arrange n objects if we permute r of them. So for example, 
What we did in this previous question is we took 26 objects and we permuted or arranged six of them. Okay, so this example over here is 26 permute 6. Took 26 objects, we permuted six of them. And if you put that into this formula, that works out to be 26 factorial over 26 minus 6 factorial. Okay, now if we expand this a little bit, this works out to be 20 factorial, right? 26 minus 6 is 20. That gives us 26 times 25 times 24 times 23 times 22 times 21. Now, after 21, it's going to be times 20 factorial, all the way down to 1. Okay? So I'm just going to, I'm not going to write all of them down. I'm just going to go times 20 factorial. And I mean, I could have started that anywhere. But I specifically chose to start doing the factorial over here because I know that the denominator is 20 factorial. And now these cancel, and you're just left with these six. Okay, so that's how the formula works. Um, but you can use it. I'm just going to demonstrate actually on the Casio because the menu is already up there, and I don't have to go to that um, that screen every time. But uh, if I put in 26 NPR permute six, that is what is it? One. 165,765,600 different passwords. Okay? It's a big number, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of passwords. Okay? All right. Oh, I think I was going to write the formula here. But you already have it down. So we'll just uh, skip that part and move on to here. Okay. So for example, how would you evaluate 7P2 using factorial notation? So using factorial notation means we're going to show our work. We're not just going to punch it into the calculator. We're going to show how this all works. Okay. So 7P2 is equal to... 7 factorial over 7 minus 2 factorial. There's a lot of chatting going on, and I can't, uh, I can't focus. I'm getting distracted. Thank you. Okay, so that works out to be 7 factorial over 7 minus 2 is 5 factorial. Okay, now at this stage, what we really want to do is, is expand to see what cancels, but one trick that you can use is whenever you get to the number that matches the smaller of the two, the rest down to one is going to be the same, right? So if I'm expanding here, seven times six, I'm just going to write this as five factorial instead of five times four times three times two times one because I know that the bottom is five factorial and then these cancel. So that makes seven times six is 42. Okay. Uh, there is actually in 30-1 quite a lot of playing around with these NPR and NCR, we'll see next week, formulas and, and uh, putting them into equations and asking you to solve for variables. So we'll get a taste of that today and we'll, we'll do more of it next week as well. Okay. Um, so here's another one. Show that 5 factorial minus 3 factorial equals 19 times 3 factorial. So the, both the left side and the right side are numbers. So ultimately, you could just evaluate each side and see how much it is, right? But it's actually kind of neat if you play around with the fact that the right side is 19 groups of 3 factorial, and then see why the left side is also 19 groups of 3 factorial. And if you kind of keep your eye on that 3 factorial piece, then if I look at this side, the, the left side is 5 times 4. Four. Now, I could do times 3 times 2 times 1, but I know that 3 factorial piece is coming up again. So I'm just going to write times 3 factorial minus 3 factorial. Okay. Now, that works out to be 20 
times 3 factorial, because 5 times 4 is 20. And then minus 3 factorial, I'm going to say minus 1 group of 3 factorial. So I just kind of inserted that coefficient of 1. And if you have 20 groups of 3 factorial minus 1 group of 3 factorial, you end up with 19 groups of 3 factorial. Okay? So there's a number of ways that you could verify this. You know, you could, you could just evaluate <laughs> what's the left side equal to, what's the right side equal to. Um, but remember that this is a numerical value, uh, e example. And you'll also have situations where you have to verify that two sides are equal, but there aren't any numbers in there or just a few numbers, uh, like in our trig identities. So I just want to show you another way that you could look at it. Okay? All right. Solve for n if n p2 equals 56. Okay. What would you do here? Yes. Yeah, so take this side, start writing that in, like put it into the formula so it's in factorial notation, right? So n p2 is n factorial over n minus 2 factorial. And that has to equal 56. OK. Now what can we do? Think about it this way. If this is smaller than this, a bunch of factors are going to cancel. So essentially what we want to do is we want to start to expand the numerator until we see that n minus 2 in the, uh, in the numerator. And then we know the rest of it is just going to be n minus 2 factorial. Right? So if I start saying, OK, well, I'm going to start by taking n and multiplying it by 1 less than n. That would be times n minus 1. Okay, the next one would be times n minus 2. Okay, now I know it's going to go from here down to 1, and then I've got that n minus 2. So I'm just going to write it as n minus 2 factorial from this point on over n minus 2 factorial. So I expand it a little bit until I can see what I want from the denominator. And that has to equal 56. Okay, now all of this cancels with all of that. And so we end up actually with a quadratic equation. So we will get n times n minus 1 equals 56. Okay, we can expand here. n squared minus n and then I'm going to subtract 56 from both sides because it's quadratic, so we need to equate one side to 0. Minus 56 equals 0. OK. And this is factorable. So we can factor this. So we're looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 56 and add to negative 1. So that would be negative 8 and 7. And so from this equation, we get that n equals 8 or n equals negative 7. Okay. Now, factorials are only defined for whole numbers. You can't take negative 7 factorial. It's, it's not a defined value. And so this one is actually extraneous. Okay. So in this formula, NPR, n must be greater than or equal to 0, and n is an element. I could even just write n as an element of the whole numbers. Whole numbers are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, whatever. All right. Wait, so if it was 0, 1, 2, 0, like 8. So I, I thought someone might ask this question. And I actually made a mental note 
this morning. I was like, I need to look into why, but zero factorial is defined to be one. Okay, so I'm gonna write that down. And this is by definition. So that means mathematicians decided when they put in this notation that this would be true. But I can't remember exactly why, but there is a reason why it fits into other laws as well. Kind of like the zero exponent. To anything to the zero is equal to one. That's by definition, but it fits in with all the other exponent laws. So let me come back. I'll, this is true, but let, let me come back to why. Okay? I'll, that's my homework for the weekend. Okay. Motorcycle license plates consist of two different letters followed by four different digits. How many license plates are possible? Okay, so things like this, really important to pay attention to those words because what this means is that repetitions are not allowed, right? Now, if repetitions were allowed, it doesn't explicitly have to be said repetitions are allowed. I could just say motorcycle license plates consist of two letters followed by four digits, right? If that's what you see, repetition is allowed, okay? So it's kind of like if that word's omitted, it's the other situation. Um, okay, so. How many different license plates are possible? Okay, so here we have two letters, letter, letter, followed by four digits. Two, three, four. Digit, 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 digit. Okay? Um, so, and no repetition. So, for the first letter, we have 26 options. On the second one would be 25. And then what about the digits? 10 times 9 times 8 times 7, right? We, you can have the first digit be 0 if it's a license plate. That's not a problem. It's just if it says it's a, it's a four-digit number or a three-digit number or something like that. Okay, so I don't know what that is. It doesn't matter. I know that you guys can put that into your calculator and get whatever the value is. It's a very large number. Okay? All right, Peter did not study for his math test. He must answer 10 multiple choice questions with four choices each. If he guesses on each question, how many different ways could he record his answer? Okay. So how many decisions does Peter have to make? 10, right? For question one, eight, nine, 10. So this is like Q1, Q2, Q10, right? How many options does he have for each question? Four. And that's the same for every single question. So that's four to the 10, which is, I don't know, uh, it's large. It's a lot of different possible answer keys. Uh, it's 1,084,576. Very, very unlikely that he's going to guess, if he's truly guessing for every single question, that he's going to get 10 out of 10. Okay? Yes? 48,000? Four to the power 10? Uh, okay, I'm going to have to look at your calculator. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but it should be this. Um, by the way, on like a diploma exam, for example, we have to submit a seating plan um, to Alberta Ed. And what they do is if everybody gets 100%, then you assume that you know, they're just, or two people, let's say two people beside each other get 100%, you assume that they know what they're doing. But if two people who are sitting right beside each other or one in front of the other both get 76%, then what they do is they look at where they're sitting and they compare their answers. And if they have the same wrong answers, 
there's a very strong likelihood that there, somebody was looking at someone else's paper. It's very unlikely that that would happen, right? Um, and so when I'm supervising, I always say to people, cover up your answer sheet, cover up, like some people have their answer sheet kind of sticking out on their table, right? And you need to know if that happens, both people get zero and have to retake the diploma. So you want to keep yours covered so that nobody looks at you. And it usually doesn't happen. It's pretty rare. But I was at a school once where they determined that two people were, or somebody was looking at someone else's paper. Yeah. Keep those bubble sheets covered. OK. Very unlikely that two people have the same wrong answers. OK. Here's another question. How many four-digit numbers can be formed if only the digits 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are used and no repetitions of digits is allowed? OK. OK, so only the these digits can be used and no repetition is allowed. So we're making a four-digit number, and we can only use digits 1 to 5. No repetitions. So we have five options for the first digit, four for the second, three for the third, and two for the fourth. So that's a total of 60. Yes? Yes, and we're going to get to that in a second. Because you're right, ordinarily we'd have to consider that, but we're only allowed digits 1 through 5 in the first place. OK? Yeah. 20, to, yeah. 120. OK. Any digit can be used, but not repeated. So now all the digits, 0 through 9, are allowed. OK. So how many options do we have for the first digit? Yep. Yes. This is 9, because we can only digit use digits 1 to 9. Yeah, the second one is now nine because after you place the first digit, you have eight from here left, plus you throw in the zero, right? So this is nine as well. Uh, you put zero back in. Or you could think of you've used up one digit here, so you have nine left here, and then it's times eight, uh, sorry, eight times seven. Okay, so I don't know what that is. Uh, 4,536. Yeah. So for the first digit, you can only use digits one to nine. Imagine like they're in a bag. You can only use those nine. So let's say you put out, pull out a two. Right? When you're placing your second number, zero, you can put a second a zero in here. So you throw that back into the bag, and now you have everything except for a two in here. Zero, one, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's still nine left. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. Uh, all right. And finally, any digit can be used and can be repeated. This is actually how many four-digit numbers are there. So For the first digit, again, we can only use 1 to 9. So this is 9 options. But then for the rest of them, we can have repetition, and anything is up for grabs. So this is 10, 0 to 9, 10, 0 to 9, and 10, 0 to 9 can be used. And that's 9,000 numbers, OK? And that's true because. The number of four digit numbers that you have. There is a black GMC truck that is blocking the bay door to the automotive department. You need to go and move this truck, please, or it will be moved for you. Thank you. This 1,000 to 9999 is 9,000 different numbers. It's confusing because the difference is not 9,000. The difference is 8,999, but you have to count the ends, right? So it's like counting from 0 to 1. There's a difference of 1, but 0 to 1 is two different numbers. 
Okay? Same sort of idea. All right. So we have a little bit more time. I'm going to keep going because we'll finish this on Tuesday. Um, now we're going to throw in some more uh, complications, shall we say. So, so far, we have been looking at arranging different objects. Or if we're arranging objects that can be used more than once, there's been repetitions. Okay. So something like this. Let's say we have the letters in the word mo. We want to know how many ways could we arrange those letters. Well, we kind of already know from looking at permutations. We have three options for the first. Whoops. Put it up there. Two for the second and one for the third, which is six, right? But if you actually look at Y, you know, you could do M-O-W, you could do M-W-O, you could start with the W, W-O-M, W-M-O, or you could start with the O, O-M-W, O-W-M. Okay, so there's the six different permutations. Okay. Now, if we change this from mo to mu, two of the objects are now identical and they're indistinguishable. And so, if we look at the number of arrangements of the letters in the word mu, we have m o o, right? These two are indistinguishable. So I suppose the difference is where, what position is the M in? So you could put M first, you could put M second, and you could put M third. So there's only three arrangements when you have two identical letters. Right? So this is now only three arrangements. Okay. So here's how it works. What you actually have to do when there's identical op uh, options is divide out the number of ways that you could arrange those objects if they were distinguishable, right? So express both A and B in factorial notation. A was three factorial. B, well, if there weren't repetitions, you would start with three factorial, but you have to divide out, suppose those two O's were different how many ways could you ar arrange those two different letters? And it would be two times one, which is two factorial. Okay, so what you're doing in the denominator is dividing out the uh, repetitions. Or the, I should say, I guess, not repetitions, but the number of ways you, can arrange, you could arrange the identical objects. And there's two of them. Okay, so if you know how to do it, this becomes a very sort of straightforward question. You just have to look for those identical objects. Like, for example, in the word Mississippi. M-I-S-S-I-S-S-I-P-P-I. I don't actually think it's a word. I think it's a place, right? It's a, like, you couldn't use that in Scrabble, I don't think. Can you? Maybe. No. Places and names are not words. I don't know. I'm, I'm pretty uh, competitive when it comes to Scrabble. But I don't know. OK, I'm going to look into this, too. Yeah. Scrabble rule. OK. so. Essentially what we want to do here, there's lots of repetition. So how many letters are there all together? There's 11 letters. And then let's like keep track of the repetition. So, or identical objects. So there's one, two, three, four I's. And there's one, two, three, four S's. And there's two P's. Okay? 
So the number of ways that we can arrange the letters in Mississippi is going to be 11 factorial. That's if they were all different. And then divide out the ways that you could arrange all of these identical letters. So 4 factorial times 4 factorial times 2 factorial. Okay. Now, I'm going to trust that you can put that into your calculator and get the value. Or do you want me to go through that? Yes? Is there any way to, like, make 4 factorial times 4 factorial If you did 4 factorial in brackets and then squared it, you could. But honestly, so on the TIs, it's a good question. It's a pain in the butt to get to that factorial button, right? So for the smaller number, numbers, I know my factorial is up to 5. 1 factorial is 1, 2 factorial is 2, 3 factorial is 6, 4 factorial is 24, 5 factorial is 120. So what I would do, personally, is I'd put that one in and then go divide by, in brackets, 24 times 24 times 2, right? And when you play around with factorials enough, you'll start to know what some of them are. Yeah. Okay. How many five different numbers can you make by arranging the digits of 17,171? Very similar type of question. We've got seven digits, or sorry, five digits to work with, but some of them are identical. So we've got three ones, so we'll divide by three factorial, and two sevens. So that's, uh, I don't know, 120 over six times two, so that's 10. 10 different ways. Okay, um, I think, well, actually, let's start this question, and then I think that'll be it for today. We'll see how far we get. We might get interrupted by some announcements. This is a pathway question, and we're going to, as we go through this unit, learn more and more strategies to solve this kind of question. But essentially, the idea is, how many ways can you walk from A to B if you can only go down and right? Okay. And to understand sort of how it works, um, think about moving to each new intersection. If you start here, how many ways could you get here? What about here? Still one, because you have to go straight down. That's only one way to go. And here is also one. Okay? Here would also be one, because you have to go right. You can't like go down and then right and then back up, because you're not allowed to go up. Here is also one. You have to go right two spaces. One, one, and one. OK? Now, how many ways could you get to this place? Two, because you could go from here or from here. What about to here? Three, because you could come from here or here. Now, there's two ways to get to here, plus one way to get to there, three total. So what I'm doing is I'm taking these two and adding. And that's the number of pathways to get to each new place, right? Here would be four. This guy would be three. And then three plus three is six. Six plus four is 10. And then you kind of keep going along. One plus three is four. Whoops. Four plus six is 10. 10 plus 10 is 20. One plus four is five. Five plus 10 is 15. 15 plus 25 is 35. And then six, 21, 56. There's 56 different paths that you could take. Okay? Now, how does this relate to what we just did? Well, if you think about this, if you're going from A to B, you have to go eight blocks. Think about it as blocks, okay? And at some point, you have to go down three times. So there's three downs, and there's five rights. And essentially what we have to do is arrange these decisions, okay? Now, if they were all different, if you're going in eight different directions, that would be eight factorial. 
but we have to divide out the repetitions. So 3 factorial for down times 5 factorial for right. Okay. Now, when I'm doing these, I find it sometimes also faster than going on my calculator. I go 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 factorial over 3 factorial times 5 factorial. Now, these cancel. 3 factorial is 6. But does it matter that that's a negative 5 factorial or it's that one? Negative 5 factorial? Yeah, because it's minus. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Times. Yeah, sorry, I thought that was a Okay, and so you get the same answer. Okay, so we'll pick up more on this on Tuesday. This is one way you can do it.